Hello everybody, my name is Altamish Nayyar Khan and I'm known as Atish and I'm a top rated Fiverr seller. Today I'm going to be talking about how you can start a freelancing career or how you can become a freelancer and hopefully I will share whatever I know and how I started my career as a freelancer and hopefully by the end you will get an idea of what you should do if you also want to become a freelancer. So before we begin, you have to ask yourself why you want to become a freelancer. Either you do not like to work 9 to 5, you don't want to work under somebody, you don't want to be told what to do, or you simply want to work at your own pace. Whatever the case is, you need to decide first why you want to become a freelancer and know whether it's worth it or not. If you want to, if you like the idea of starting your own business and you like the idea of running a business, then yes, you can or you should become a freelancer because you are essentially a businessman. You are a business owner as soon as you become a freelancer. If you like that idea, you should immediately start, you should immediately start thinking about becoming a freelancer. So I have a presentation ready, which will give you an idea of what you should ask yourself what you should do and how you can start freelancing. So please let us start the presentation, if possible. Turn the lights off, please. So the first thing is that you should not try to become a freelancer or just become a freelancer for the sake of, oh, my friend is a freelancer and he's earning well, so I should also start freelancing. You should first take a look at what service is in demand. That's the first thing that you should know about. So even though you can sell basically any skill, which means if you're an engineer, an accountant, a developer, a game developer, a web developer, you can sell that skill. You can sell any skill, but to make a good living, you need to take a look at the most valuable skills and what is in demand. So if you are a writer, now you'll find many writers and people that can write articles and create good articles, but there are only a few that write good and write well. So we'll wait for it to return and then I'll speak. Okay, so I'll start again. What I was saying is, is that you may have a skill, but if that skill is not in demand, you will not succeed. You should always focus on learning skills or developing skills that are in demand. Before becoming a freelancer, take a look at what is in demand. That's the first thing. The old saying goes, if you want to become a billionaire, solve a problem that is worth a billion dollars. Keep that in mind. So if you are a game developer, you are solving maybe a $5,000 to $10,000 problem. And each project will be worth somewhere between that. So it really depends. If you're a writer, you may be earning $5 for 100 words. Depends on your skill. Take a look at what problem you want to solve, what service you will provide. And if, that's, if that solution is valuable, you will be paid accordingly. You may need to learn a variety of different skills. Now, as a freelancer, do not rely on a single skill. You should have a variety of different skills. Find out what will work for you. 
You may even be forced to perform tasks that you seriously dislike. I'll share an example. A friend of mine was a front-end developer, which means he used to create websites, but only what you see, what the user sees. But as a freelancer, to earn more than $1,000, he also had to learn the back-end, which is when you log into Facebook, your credentials and your password is sent to a server, and that server uh, server tells Facebook that yes, this data was valid, so let the user log in. He had to learn that, and he absolutely hated it. But the reason why he did that is because he wanted to take his his uh, earning from one thousand dollars per month to five thousand dollars per month, and he did things that he disliked. He learned the back end how things work on the back end as well. So as a freelancer, you cannot only do what you like. You have to sometimes do things that you seriously dislike if you're serious about making a good living. So uh, that is something that you need to tell yourself. You will not always be doing things that you like. So I've already given the example of a front-end developer that you see over here, for example, front-end developers. You may have to forget about what you like or want to do and focus on acquiring skills that are in demand and can help you become successful in providing valuable solutions. So this is, uh, I don't really need to explain this. You just have to look at what is valuable. And so maybe you will like it, maybe you will not, but in order to earn well, you need to only focus on the things that are valuable in the marketplace. Next slide, please. Either learn what other freelancers are doing or find out yourself what are the most in-demand services. So most uh, platforms such as Fiverr, Upwork, Guru, Freelancer.com, even people per hour, they usually release articles and you will find articles on the internet that will give you an idea of what services are in demand. Or if you have friends or someone you know who is a freelancer, they can tell you if they want to, that is, how much they're earning. And if they are clients themselves, like I'm a client too, and I hire freelancers as well, I can get an idea of what services are in demand on which platform. But you can find articles on the internet that will tell you what services are in demand and what services work on a specific platform. For example, on Fiverr, during the NFT boom, and the NFT and cryptocurrency uh, boom, uh, Fiverr.com had a lot of service providers that were providing NFT marketplace services. So that was the most in-demand service at that time, and people were easily earning up to $50,000 per month just because they figured out that NFT marketplaces will be in demand. Focus on categories that have a very high barrier of entry. That means you should not focus or you should not uh, be looking at just to become a writer or just a person that can, anybody can be that person. The skill that you acquire should have a very high barrier of entry, which means not everybody can do it or you will need special equipment for that. For example, if you need, if you want to be a 3D modeler, you should also go into 3D rendering, which is not Everybody cannot do 3D rendering because you need a very powerful computer, which means the barrier of entry is having a powerful computer, which may cost up to $5,000 to make that computer. Now, not, not everybody will be able to afford that. So if you offer rendering services as well, and if you are an animator, the barrier of entry is slightly higher. What I'm trying to say is, is that don't try to acquire a skill which anybody can acquire and just start selling it because then you will be against a lot of people and they will be providing the same service as you and you will really not be able to get as many clients as you can if there are there are a large number of people providing that service focus on category services that are extremely difficult to master so programming uh, for programmers you will find many programmers on Upwork, Fiverr, Guru. However, there are only a few people over there that are masters at what they do. And people, generally speaking, clients, generally speaking, will prefer a master to solve their problem than a person who will provide them a run-of-the-mill solution. 
which I've all, uh, this is in the second point, this is what I was talking about, which is run of the mill solution, a solution that anybody can provide. So you should always try to try to acquire a skill. Okay, you'll learn it, but to master it, you will you will need to work really hard. And clients will prefer masters over people who can just provide a solution off the internet, just copy paste that or do something similar. Try to keep a close eye on the market trends and be the first one to offer a solution based on those trends. So I was talking about NFT marketplaces. During the NFT boom and the cryptocurrency boom, um, these uh, services you found on Upwork on, and on Fiverr.com, there were many there were many services that were offering NFT marketplaces and cryptocurrency websites. Even they, even, uh, there were many developers who were making cryptocurrencies and tokens. So this was a market trend. People saw it and people earned thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars because they were the first one to offer that. Next slide, please. You need to learn how to be a good salesman, enjoy closing deals. So. You cannot become a freelancer if you're not a good salesman. If you do not like the idea of selling your skills or wanting to sell your skills, don't ever think about freelancing. In fact, I think that learning how to sell is probably the most important skill, the most important, because even if you are a master at, at something, if you do not know how to sell, you will not be able to make a good living. I mean. People will come to you if you do not know how to sell your services for a good price. You may end up taking a project that is worth $5,000 for $1,000 if you do not know how to sell well. You should always know how to sell your skill. And this is the most important, the most important skill, the most important. Even if you are average at what you do, if you're a good salesman, you might be making more than what a master is who is not a good salesman. This is probably the most important skill you need as a freelancer. You must know how to sell your skill services at a high value and establish yourself as a remarkable solution provider. So your client needs to, basically he needs to talk to you. When he talks to you, he should say, this guy is the perfect solution provider. Even if you're not, you have to sell yourself that way. You have to learn that skill. Learn the, way, learn the various tactics that skilled salespeople use to close deals before even thinking about freelancing. I've told this to you. Before you think about freelancing, learn how to sell. You should be able to sell anything. Basically, when you can sell anything, you, are, you know how to sell anything, then is the time you can think about freelancing, not before that. You should be able to demonstrate your skills to a potential client by asking intelligent questions. Now, asking intelligent questions mean that you're talking to a client. The client says, I want this. You say, okay, why do you want this? What is the purpose? What are you trying to achieve? When you ask these questions, essentially, you're telling the client, I'm taking interest in solving your problem. That is the thing that the client needs to know. He needs to be convinced the client needs to be convinced that you are interested in getting the work done and you want to give them the solution. You have to ask those kind of questions that will lead to a, lead to a possible solution. This is actually the best way to close a deal as the client may believe you are the right person for the job if you ask the right questions. Next slide. The, clients, the client needs you more than you need the client. Now that's like, that surprises a lot of people. The client needs me, I don't need the client. Well, that is true. It is very difficult to find good people in on online marketplaces. Extremely difficult. The client needs you more than you need the client. Keep that in mind. Why? I'll explain. It is extremely difficult to find good freelancers that provide good quality solutions. Let's come back to the point, run of the mill solutions, WordPress websites, relatively easy to make, but if a client wants a customized solution, you need to know how to make a website from scratch using the latest technologies. That is the problem. There are people that offer run-of-the-mill solutions, which person XYZ can provide, but finding good freelancers that are committed to getting work done 
and also communicate effectively are difficult to find. I, as a client, can tell you I had to literally force the people that I hired to work on the things that they're being paid, for, paid to do. So I found it difficult as a client to get work done because they were not communicating. Sometimes they wouldn't reply for three days. Then they would give, up, give me something that I did not want, I did not ask for. So it is extremely difficult to find good, uh, good freelancers. And this is the thing, the client needs you more than you need the client means that if you prove to the client that you are the best person and you work well, they need you, they will be after you, they'll cling on to you, they'll not let you go because they're difficult to find. And most clients that you will meet in the world will tell you it's difficult to find clients, uh, it's difficult to find freelancers that can work consistently and e effectively. Most clients that are serious about getting work done prioritize effective communication. Effective communication, key point, effective communication, above everything else, and may hire you for future work based on your communication skills alone. So if you're good at communicating, yet you're making mistakes, the client will forgive you. Most clients will forgive you if your communication skills are good. Because if you're making a mistake, some people try to cover it up. Just be honest and tell them that this was the mistake that I made. There was this, th this was the problem. I apologize, however, I will rectify it. This is, this is a better way of just avoiding or not replying to clients, which many freelancers do. Some clients wish to work with one freelancer for a long time and will prefer freelancers that are skilled and keen to actually get the job done as efficiently as possible. So a client will prefer working with a freelancer who can do a task in one week, not in 10 days, when there is really no, uh, no reason why he's taking 10 days. So generally speaking, if a client comes to you and he or she has worked with a previous freelancer, another freelancer, and uh, they have disappointed, they're saying they're slow. You do the work and that work is done within a week and that freelancer, the other freelancer was taking 15 days. They're going to prefer you because they will believe you're more efficient. However, that does not mean that you should undervalue yourself. So if you're saving the client's time and you're efficient, you should not be punished for being efficient. You can charge more if you're efficient because you will be saving the client's time. So if you can, uh, like people say that uh, people ask what your hourly rate is. At that time, I usually tell them, why do you want to know about my hourly rate? Should I be punished for completing the work quickly? Like if, there, uh, if my hourly rate is $50 per hour and uh, the value of the solution is $1,000, that means I'll, I'm doing it in two hours. I'm earning $100 for something that I believe is worth 1000 So I'm being punished for completing something for two, uh, inside two hours when I have the knowledge and skill to do it. I shouldn't be punished for that. So when you're efficient, you can also tell the client that I'm saving your time and your time is valuable. You can say that. Clients value freelancers. Oh, sorry, I've already said that. Most, pro most projects fail when freelancers are not serious about completing tasks miss deadlines or simply do not communicate well. So again, serious about completing tasks, miss deadlines or simply do not communicate well. I think the simply do not communicate well thing, that is the most important because if you don't communicate well, doesn't matter how good you are, how good you are at your job, you will most likely fail most of your projects. Next slide. Learn to give the client what they want. What does that mean? If the client wants X, give them X. If the client wants Y, give them Y. Don't uh, say to the client, what you're asking for is not good. Never say that. Just give the client what they want and that's it. Nothing more. Give the client what they want. The client is not here to build your portfolio. If what they're asking for, for example, if you're a graphic designer, what they're asking for a corrector that is absolutely ridiculous and ugly, and that thing will go in your portfolio, you should not worry about that. Instead, let's see what you can do. If the client knows exactly what they want, give them exactly what they want. Don't tell the client that what you're, what you're asking for is not good. Trust me, clients don't like that. Just give them what they want. Instead of having a portfolio that showcases the final product, showcase the process of developing the product, 
or providing the solution in your portfolio. So if you think the product is not good, if you think that you have made a design which is absolutely pathetic, not good to look at, show the process instead. Because clients will know that if they're working with you, they're going to go from step one, two, three, four, five until they get the result that they want. That is what I as a client want to see. I want to see if I'm contacting you, how will you, how will you do this work? What is the process? How will we reach the final solution? How will we, how will we do that? That is what clients are interested in. Clients will not take a look at your portfolio and probably that, that uh, the design is pretty good yet you have now not explained how you actually made the design what you did how you what questions you asked and how you reached this solution how you provided the solution clients want to know your process if they know your process you have, if if you have a good process 50% of the deal is closed uh, just focus on that your process should be good and it should be easy to understand clients will be more interested in your success rate than how pretty your portfolio looks. So the client, when he, when the client comes and talks to you, they are, they are going to spend a significant amount of time explaining to you what the project is, what the goals are, and how, and what kind of result the client is, uh, the client wants. So they will take a look at your success rate. Now, if you can demonstrate or you can simply show to the client that if you uh, that nine out of ten projects you complete successfully, that is a good sign. They will be, they will take more interest in your success rate than your, the, than how pretty your portfolio looks. So, if your success rate is good, it means that the client, when they work with you, the risk of failure is low based on your history. Clients will take an interest in your process more than the final product. That is. 100% true, even for me as a game developer, I'm a video game developer, most clients talk about the process. They do not, they do not look at my previous projects and say, oh, you're a good, good video game developer. Every client, even for my friends, always say that we came to you because of the video that you posted, which, which showcases how, what the process is and which tells me exactly how you will take me from point A to point B and give me the solution that, that is required. Next slide. Learn not to go beyond the sale. The client says, okay, deal, done. Uh, okay, fine, so you're here, okay, fine, but you know, we do this, we do that, don't do that, just don't go beyond the sale. If the client says, yes, we are doing this for $1,000, basically just, Keep quiet, start working. That's it, just stop right there. Resist the urge to say anything which will, which will uh, to say to the, uh, which will probably put into the mind of the client that, oh, I think I'm making a mistake. As soon as the sale is complete, as soon as the deal is done, just stop. Don't say anything, start working. I've seen many people who go beyond the sale. So when the sale is done, they say, end up saying something and then they fail the deal doesn't get closed. The client says, oh, I didn't know that this was also something that we have to consider. This, 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 this happens a lot. Another, another thing that you must not do is don't oversell your service. So if the client wants a solution why, talk about solution why. Don't try to offer other services before this one is complete. All right, don't oversell it. Don't try to put in extras when they're not really required. Only focus on talking about solutions and problems. Only focus on demonstrating that you are the best person to provide the solution that the client requires. Okay? Avoid appearing persuasive. Don't use the word please. If you have to use the word please, just say, please tell me about uh, the problems that you're currently facing. I want to solve them. Okay? I suggest that we take a look at this solution. I think this will work for you. What do you think about it? What do you think about this solution? Okay, so you like this solution? Okay, this is how I'm going to do it. This is how I'm going to provide you the solution. If you like it, we can start working right now. But I'll not say, please hire me because you know I haven't had a project for such a long time and I, I need to you know have a, pro have a project that I'm, I'm just starting out. Don't say things like that. There are many freelancers who say that, please hire me, I will, I will do the best I can. Don't do that. Don't do that. Just just talk about the problems and the solutions. That's it. Just 
engage the client. Next slide. Learn the art of rejecting work and firing clients. Okay. Uh, I like firing clients a lot, when, since, uh, especially when uh, I know that it's going to take away the stress from me. So only accept a job if you believe you can provide a good solution. So now, during the conversation, you find out that the client requires something that you cannot provide. Stop. Don't try to sell your service. If you are certain that this particular part of the project you cannot do, immediately tell the client that I cannot do this. However, I can do the other 80%, just the 20% I can't do. So can we do this, that you hire this, uh, hire another person for the 20% and I can do the rest of the 80%? Is that a possibility? M uh, the client might say, I want somebody who can do 100%. At that time, you, you say, good luck. Thank you for contacting me. That's it. Don't, don't, don't try, try, again, don't try to persuade. Just end it right there. Just try your best. I'll do 80%. Somebody else will do the 20%. Why I can't do the 20%? It's because there aren't enough resources on the internet, online, or in books. I do not know how to do this. I've never come across this problem before. But that's what you should do. Never let money control you. You were making life work before the client contacted you. So if a client calls, messages you, uh, texts you, you were making life work before the client contacted you. So just because the client says, I've got $2,000, let's get this done. But you know at that time that, oh, I will not be able to do this work properly. I think the client is not, is not going to be a good person to work with. You, you find that out during the conversation that he's probably rude or saying things which you don't like. But the $2,000, you need that. You need that for... Uh, to buy something or you need that to pay the bills. Well, before the client contacted you, you were making life work somehow. So don't let money control you. I'm not saying that money is important. It is. But it is better to, to save yourself from the stress of working with somebody that you do not want than going, uh, than go, uh, going for the $2,000 that you may not even receive. If the project fails, you're not going to receive it anyway and you were making life work before you had the $2,000. So never let money control you. Money is important, just don't let it control you. Reject clients that do not know what they want and are not willing to work with you to get the work done or refuse to provide any creative input. So I expect my clients to tell me what to do or how to do it, not, not both of those things. So they can say, they can tell me what they want or they can tell me how to do it. So it's a red flag if they do both. They tell me what to do and how to do it. It means that, that, that they don't need me. So they do not need me if they know what they want and they also know how to get it. They only need me if they know what they want but they can't do it, do it themselves or they tell me how to do something but they do not know what they want. These are the two things that I, that, uh, that I focus on. So... If the client does not know what they want, they're just, they're just going to be like, I want a video game that is a 2D side scroller. I ask them, what kind of a side scroller, scroller do you need? They say, we don't know. We just want a side scroller. I say, well, I can't help you. You need to know what you want. I need to know what result you're expecting from me. What if I make a 2D side scroller that is also a racing game? Would you accept that? And they'll be like, well, now we, oh, I'd say we'd want a Mario clone. We want a game that looks like Mario or looks like Street Fighter, let's say. Like, yeah, now you're telling me what you want. You know, now you're telling me, now, not before that. There, I mean, a, a client comes and uh, says, I want a fighting game. Okay, what kind? There are many fighting games, 3D, 2D. Do you want a fighting game? That, I mean, fighting game, a jet fighter game is also a fighting game. What fighting game do you want? Tell me. If you do not know what you want, how can I... How can I give you something if you do not know what you want? Reject clients that do not know anything about your field and the solutions that you can provide. So I expect clients to have an idea of what kind of result they will get. If the client orders a website, they should know just a few features or how a website works, at least something that they know that there is supposed to be a navigation bar, there's supposed to be a logo on top, and how websites work, and uh, the importance of being dynamic. That is, if the browser is um, 
is minimized, maximized, how will the website perform, things like that. And if the client doesn't know, I try to explain it to them. But they should, generally speaking, have a little idea of how websites work and how what they're asking for, how it works. Just a little bit. If they do not know anything about what you're providing or what you will provide, don't work with such clients because you will probably end up spending 80% of your time explaining to them why you're doing what you're doing, which is a waste of time. L learn when to fire a client if you feel that like the project will fail anyway due to poor communication, improper definition of scope of work or bad behavior. So any of these points, if you feel like the project will fail due to poor communication, client does not respond for a month, the improper definition of scope of work, the client does not tell exactly what they want, or bad behavior. So bad behavior if the client is rude, just, just fire them, don't tolerate that. Next slide. Define the scope of work. Now that scope of work, you see it's, it's it's, uh, I use caps lock for that because I want you to focus on that. Scope of work is important because you should know what you're doing and what you're being paid for and the client should know what he is paying you to do. So if the scope of work is not clear, that means that things are vague. The client may include something during the project which was not, which was not supposed to be part of the project. They can immediately add that and then the entire project will go into something called development hell. That is not something that you want. The scope of work should be well defined. I want A, B, C, D, and we are going to do A, B, C, D using these methods. And that's it. If, if you try to add anything else, I will charge you for that. And uh, there's like no, don't compromise. Don't, uh, don't do that. Only accept work if the client agrees to pay per module. That means that if the project is, uh, it requires task A, B, C, D, E, F, G to be done, just charge for A and B. Say we are going to do task A and B first, that is a module. That is one module that is, that is like a module which will, uh, which will fit in to C and D. So we'll work in a modular fashion. So if the, like, for example, if you're writing an article or a, or a paper of some kind, and especially if you're writing an article, say I'm going to write 200 words and I'm going to charge you for that. Then I'm going to write the other 200 words. I'm going to charge you for that. I'm going to complete one chapter, going to charge you for that. I'm going to write the second chapter, going to charge you for that. So that way you will also get an idea of how the client will work with you and whether he is serious about paying you or not. Immediately reject anything that is outside the scope of work unless the client wishes to pay you for the extra work and it doesn't affect the project in any negative manner. So for example, if we have decided that we are going to write a book, chapter one, chapter 10, 10 chapters, but the client says, I want uh, chapter, uh, I want 11 chapters and this chapter three should be in between chapter uh, chapter two and three right now. So it's going to be three and four then. You, you can say, well, well, I can do that. I've written the entire book. Uh, uh, like after I've written a book from chapter one to 10 and I can't fit another chapter in like that. That's going to ruin the entire book. I, I can't do that. Th that. That's impossible. So you can say that and tell the client, I'm sorry, this is not what we agreed to do. Uh, if, if we do that, even if you pay me, you will end up getting something that you do not want. And I can I mean, I'll have to charge you double because I'll have to change all the chapters based on that new chapter. Next slide. What are the best platforms to start learning new skills? Udemy, YouTube, Coursera, Skillshare, Khan Academy, LinkedIn Learning, edX and Open edX, Teachable. These are the platforms that I use. I use Udemy primarily because Udemy has uh, courses that are continuously updated and Udemy is also premium, so I like Udemy. And on YouTube, if you're looking for a specific problem that you want to solve, somebody may have come up with a solution. So you can search for Udemy. Uh, so you can search on YouTube for that problem uh, and hopefully you'll get the results. And YouTube is free, uh, but Udemy is not. But you should only focus on Udemy and YouTube as you can learn new skills and you can also complete the course and have proof that you have completed that course because they give you a certificate. Next slide. Figure out which platform will work for you. 
So figure out which platform attracts clients that require the skills that you have. So for example, on Upwork.com, I have I, I'm not successful on Upwork.com because the job posts over there are cross posts. So they have posted them on other websites and they also post them on Upwork. They're not serious about hiring game developers on Upwork. They may hire game developers on some other website. You should learn which platform will actually be the best for the skills that you offer. And you can find that out by reading articles or researching on the internet. Consider the workflow of the platforms. So based on your personal personality type, there are certain platforms that have a workflow that will suit you. Other platforms may have a workflow that does not suit you. For example, if you must have a video call with the client, must have a video call with the client, Upwork is probably the best platform because Fiverr does not allow video calls, but Upwork does. So if for some reason you believe that you cannot explain everything, everything through text, then Upwork is probably the best, best option for you. Learn how platforms help clients connect to freelancers. Platforms may offer a solution that suits your personality type. So Fiverr has a different way of connecting clients to freelancers. Upwork has a different method. It, you have to choose one that suits you. On Fiverr, clients find you. On Upwork, you have to find the clients. Consider how many freelancers are already working on a platform and get an idea of their skills. See if you can offer better quality solutions than them. So if you have to get an idea of, uh, what the, of, of what freelancers are doing currently on a platform, just take a look at, look at those freelancers, maybe create an order with them or place an order and, uh, or just work with them, create something like a fake, fake, uh, fake problem and try to find out what they do. And if you believe you can provide a better solution than them, you can actually copy them and just provide a better solution. It has worked tremendously for some of my friends. Take a look at reviews or simply get a feel of each platform for a period of at least three months before deciding to make one platform your main platform. So for me, it took about five months, but uh, generally speaking, after working for three months, you will get an idea of which, pla which platform is working best for you. And that should be your main platform then. The other platforms also work on them, but there should be one main. Next slide. How long does it take to learn a new skill and start earning? You will usually make your first $100 in the first six months after you have learned a particular skill. This is totally according to my experience. However, results vary based on your platform. So I said 100 because I'm not a get-rich-quick scammer. The $100 is actually, is actually a very good amount in six months if you're starting because you'll be, you'll, be, uh, you'll be facing a lot of competition. You will not have an established reputation on that platform. So it'll take you about six months. I've seen people that uh, find uh, long-term clients on Upwork within the first six months that pay them $1,000, $2,000 per month. It happens, but it's rare. Or if you have worked for like a, some big company and then now you're working on Upwork.com, probably clients will hire you based on that. But generally speaking, $100, the first $100 in the first six months is actually good. It's not bad, even though it may seem like that because after six months, you might be earning uh, yearly $50,000, $60,000 once, uh, once you have a reputation built. You may spend up to a year acquiring a new skill after which you have to start selling it. So you can spend a long time learning a skill, but just spend a year developing a skill. Uh, usually people start after six months. As soon as you learn something, try to sell it. So if you've learned a part of something big, just focus on trying to get clients for that part. Sell that skill as quickly as possible. It is a good idea to acquire multiple skills that are somehow related to each other. For example, you can choose to learn logo design along with UX wireframe design. The two are closely related as they use similar tools. So logo design, everybody knows what logo is, but you use Photoshop. So on Photoshop, you can also design wireframes. You can also design backgrounds for games. You can also design characters. So if you're using a tool, learn what you can do using, the, using that tool, all of the different things that you can provide. So it should not just be one thing, it should be many. For example, I use the Unity game engine. It can be used for animation, for videos, for 3D modeling, for prototyping, for AR, VR. There are so many things that that tool can do. I, I develop 2D games, 3D games. I develop uh, educational games. So 
you should know what your tool can do and how many things your tool can do for you. The, the, they should be related. So the, the work that you do should be related somehow because UX, wireframe, the tools are similar and also wireframes are used for website design and logos are needed on a website. So that's how they're related. There is no get rich quick trick. Some freelancers may be at the right place at the right time and make millions during the fir their first year. Whereas the majority start to make a decent living in their third year. That's just me being honest. Next, next slide. Do you need to work for a company before thinking about freelancing? It depends on your field. It depends on your field. A company may help you get an idea of a standard process that the particular industry uses to get work done. So sometimes you need to work for a company to get an idea of the industry standards. Sometimes you need to actually work for a company. You can also simply learn about standard processes without working for a company. This is extremely difficult to do as resources for that may not be available online. So if you're not working for a company or you've not, you don't want to work for a company, you can still find out what their standard process is, but it's difficult. It really depends on whether you can find it on the internet. There are certain fields that simply require you to work for an organization for some time. So uh, doctors usually need to work at a hospital before they start their private practice. Next slide. How to get my first project. It is recommended that you create an account on Fiverr, Upwork, and Guru to start. Other platforms include PeoplePower, Freelancer.com, and Toptal. The process of getting a project depends on the platform. Fiverr is a platform where clients find you. Upwork is a platform where you need to find clients by sending proposals to clients that have a job posted on their, on their feed. So it really depends. Uh, if you are on Fiverr, you may need to respond to something called buyer requests. But on Upwork, you will have a difficult time getting your first project because uh, there might be experienced freelancers with a history that people might consider hiring them instead of you because you have zero history. But on certain platforms, it's easier to get your first job. On other platforms, it's difficult. However, it really depends on what suits you. You may... You have to be quick to respond to a potential client and immediately start talking about the potential client's problems. You can start by asking intelligent questions. So on up, when you start on Fiverr and on Upwork, you have to be very active. So as soon as the client uh, messages you, respond immediately because they might be messaging other people as well. So you want to engage them right then and there. Only talk about the solution that you can offer to the client based upon the answers that the client gives. So this is because the client does not have anything on the platform that will tell them about you. No history, no work history, no success rate, nothing. You can talk about the previous projects that you have done off platform, but they will have nothing, no data on you. So immediately start talking about this, uh, the, about the problems and the solutions so that the client uh, client understands, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. He knows his stuff. Use a technique called price bracketing, which is just a price range instead of a fixed price. This will help you get an idea of how much the client wishes to spend and may help you engage the client. So instead of saying, okay, I'll develop a website for you for $2,000, you're going to say, okay, so I'm going to develop a website for you. I think the price is going to be between $1,000 to $4,000. It really depends on how much value you require. So let's talk about what you require and how many features you require. And based on that, I'll be able to give you a fixed price. But just to engage the client, between 1000 to 4000 the client will say, well, that's a big price range. So what's the difference? You're going to say, if you have this, this, this feature is going to be 1200 This is this, this, this feature, 1800 This, this, this feature is going to be 3000 So you're engaging the clients. You're giving them multiple options, which is a part of selling actually. If you're confident that you can provide a good solution and the client is paying you for the solution according to its value, continue the conversation. So if the client wants a solution that is worth $5,000 but is, uh, is, uh, wants to pay you $1,000, just discontinue the conversation. It's not going to be good for you and it's not going to be good for the client either. In fact, the person who is going to do something that is worth $5,000 for $1,000, they will be taking shortcuts. 
And if they get it done, I mean, the good clients will actually know that this person has taken a shortcut or this is plagiarized or this is copied work, which can get the client in trouble, especially if it's uh, something he's using something that is licensed. Try to define the first module after defining a scope of work, then attempt to close the deal. So say that, okay, we have 10 tasks, let's do one and two, and this is the price for that, and try to close it right there. Next slide. How to minimize the risk of the project failing. Always provide screenshots, demos, drafts, or test builds to the client as soon as they are ready to, uh, as soon as they're ready to get feedback. So as soon as you complete something, take a screenshot, or give the entire file to the client, get their feedback as quickly as possible, because if they don't like something, they'll tell, tell you immediately that they don't like this and they want this to change. If you're not clear about what to do, ask the client about what to do. So if you do not know what, uh, what, the client, what you should do, just ask the client, learn how to ask. Just ask them, listen, I do not know what we should do here. What should we do? Instead of trying to figure out yourself, just ask the client. They will, they will answer the question if they're not bad clients. If you feel directionless, ask the client for direction and talk about possible ways to, com to complete a module. So if during a module you feel like you do not know what to do next, ask the client what we should do next. And then talk to the client about the possible ways to get around this problem if there is one. Make sure that the client approves drafts, demos, screenshots, or test builds, and keep the reference of that approval in text form as a screenshot or in a video form. So if the client approves task A and B, save it somewhere. So the client doesn't, uh, if, he, if the client comes back and says, wait a second, I never approved that, you can say, well, you did. So we're not going to do this again. So that's it, it's done, it's finished. You're not going to talk to me about this again. Make sure, oh, I've already done that. If you feel like a module isn't well-defined, tell that to the client and make sure that it is well-defined before starting it. So if you feel that task A and B, there is something that you don't understand, tell the client, I don't understand this. We're not going to start this project unless you tell me what this is. We have to make it crystal clear what this is. Always provide daily updates to the client and try to make a video of the work done and send it to the client to keep the client up to date. I mean, it, uh, this explained itself. So when you have made a video of the work, the client knows what you have done, and then ask the client, "Do you want any? Do you like what you what you see here? If you don't, tell it to me right now. I'm not going to come back and correct this or make any changes." So that's what you well, that's what you should learn to do. Uh, next slide, and we are done. So it's. So now we're going to move to the question and answer session and we can also do a little bit of role play if somebody wants to do some role play and that's it. A water please? Water, water please. Assalamualaikum. Oh. Very fruitful session. Sir, my question, you are totally about uh, about uh, ask uh, freelancing is effective uh, and a great way how to freelancing. But uh, you are didn't know about uh, ask to, okay, how to create an account and how to get a money procedure. Please tell me about them. How to create an account? It depends on the platform. So every platform is a different sign-up procedure and a validation procedure. And then you need to probably have a Pioneer account to receive money from the platform. However, this is how to start. So I cannot tell you 
all the platforms, how you sign up for them, because the process is different. So some some uh, platforms require validation with an ID card, some don't. Some ask you to tell your location, some don't. Fiverr.com does not. When you create a platform, they automatically detect where you're making the account from. So uh, the, the, the process for every platform is different. So I cannot generalize that. Things that I cannot generalize, I can't talk about them. But sign the process, like you sign up on Facebook, it's exactly the same thing. Thank you. If you want to role play, we can do that as well. Good so evening, sir. Good evening, sir. How are you? Uh, sir, I have a question that uh, you, we are talking about communication skills with clients. So, can you tell about more uh, communication tactics and strategies uh, with clients? Because I have tried a lot of time, but I, I got failure. All right. So, thank you so much. All right. So, okay. What do, what do you provide? Yeah, I'm a content writer. Content writer, but, okay. But uh, I have work on uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram. But uh, it's my first time on Upwork. So I got lots of clients, but the, always I just fail because of my communication skills. Okay. Yeah. So you're a content writer. What kind of content do you write? Yeah, I write about history and uh, I research papers like on uh, trend topics. You can see okay. as... Yeah. You're a client, I'm a content writer. Okay, you're a client that I've, I've given you a proposal. Or you're co contacting me, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a writer. Okay? okay, right now I'm a writer. Okay. okay. So you're the client, you ask me, ask me something or I've, I've proposed. Okay, so you're looking for the solution, I'm, I'm a con. You're looking for, okay, so you want me to write about the history of Pakistan. Can you tell me exactly what you want me to write about the history of Pakistan? Yeah, uh, you will write for history for me about uh, the issues that uh, happens in past that right. change over uh, uh, today's uh, uh, today's situations, political situation. Okay, and what will your target audience be? So, as far as I can tell, you want to know exactly what happened in the past that is now affecting our future. So, my question is that if you want me to write about this, what? What is your target audience? Who will this article be written for? The article for uh, the people who are, you know, like politics and uh, mostly uh, using uh, social media to entertain, entertain them with politics. So I'm writing an uh, article for them. No, so I'm a little confused right now. You want me to write about uh, entertain... This is going to be an article for to entertain people. So it's not going to be a serious article for information that's supposed to be for entertaining people. Yeah, it's for uh, entertain people who love politics. Okay, so it's for entertaining people that love politics. Okay, so now what I understand is, is that you want me to write an article for you based on, the his, uh, based on Pakistan's history in a funny manner presented in an entertaining way so that, uh, so that uh, we can entertain people that also like politics and we can have a little bit of jokes from here and there and some of the, uh, some of the mistakes that people have made in the past. Does that sound fair? Yes, sir. I got okay, so fine. How many words do you want for this article? It depends on the. It depends on you because uh, it will be a maximum, uh, like five hundred words or for like two hundred words between two hundred to five hundred words. Okay, so what do you think will provide the most value to your audience? Five hundred or two hundred words? I think so. It will be best for them to two hundred words, two hundred. Two hundred words. words. So yeah. you want a short article with some jokes and uh, something funny which will entertain people. Yes. All right, fine. I can do it between two dollars to ten dollars. What do you think the value of your article should be? Because based on the based on what you say right now, between two dollars to ten dollars, I'll have to use my resources based on that. So tell me. It should be near to seven or eight dollars. Seven to eight dollars, fine. I'll what I can do is right now I can work on like say fifty to uh, fifty words right now. I'll work on the, that. It'll be the first draft. Once I give it to you, you can tell me whether the direction is incorrect. If it's if uh, whether the direction is correct or not. If it's incorrect, we can talk about what direction we should take from here. Does that sound fair? Yes, that sounds fair. Fine, let's work on it. Thank you. That's good, man. That's so good. Uh, thank you very much. My question is about, uh, you said uh, you should be a better, you, you should be a good seller. Uh, can you suggest some techniques in start that uh, uh, you, uh, that how should you, you should improve as a good seller? 
Okay, so, uh, 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 sir, excuse me. Uh, you, you basically, uh, I was selling to you right now. Did you, did you take note of that? I use price yes. bracketing. Yes. Then I asked the client yes, what yes. the solutions are, what yes, he requires. Yes. That was part of sales. So I, what specifically, what is the question that you're, that, what is the, spe what specifically do you want me to answer in that sales tactics? I use price bracketing. I, I, I asked the client what I will, what I will provide, how I will provide it, and okay. what, what are the tactics that I will use to provide the solution that, he, he that the client requires. So, what specifically do you want me to answer? Uh, I mean, uh, this is. I think this is our communication. This is. Uh, yeah, it, it was sales. You, sh you should be good at communication yeah. skills. Yeah. A and any other one? Uh, well, price bracketing. Price like I said, two hundred to yes. two to ten dollars. Then he answered me. So I said, okay, we'll do. We'll do like the fifty words first. Let's see if the direction I engaged him. Okay. So basically, I've engaged the client now. I know for certain that he is he is working with me, and now it really depends on whether we can connect after that. Okay. Whether probably I send the fifty words, the client says no, this is not what we are looking for, and I'll say okay, fine, you go your way, I'll go mine. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, one thing which is, uh, uh, you know, where Indians, they have edge over Pakistanis because uh, the export, for, for instance, I mean, the export of Indian uh, software values like uh, $130 billion a year, whereas Pakistan stands at only $2 billion a year. It's a, it's a heck of a difference. I mean, India is six times bigger than Pakistan. It, they, sh they should be selling like uh, software f worth uh, uh, 12 billion, you know, if we go by that proportion. By the proportion. But, but they, you know, it's, it's so, but a lot of people say that Indians have success, and especially the freelancers and uh, the service for online service providers, they have success um, uh, over, I mean, they have more success uh, than Pakistanis do because they have they can speak better English. Okay, now the problem is I mean I'm asking a question but uh, in a way I'm also answering it. So I hope you won't mind that. Uh, okay, now the thing is that uh, a lot of people I mean I've seen a lot of uh, rhetoric going around like uh, national identity, like Urdu, make Urdu our uh, you know, everything like we should be f proud of our language and ma boli Punjabi sanu bolni chahidi Punjabi is gal karo. Instead of going, uh, what I have seen the makeup of this society is that instead of progressing, they are regress. They they are it's a regressing society. We talk more about. Uh, things which have no use, no practical use when we come to international markets. I mean, an average uh, Indian and or an average Sri Lankan or even a Bangladeshi can speak, speak can converse better in English than an average Pakistani can. What are your comments? Yes, it's true. Okay. <laughs> it's it's basically because um, uh, like uh, the Indians, they basically, uh, as far as I can tell, they believe that they have to work with the world. The world will not work with them. That's what I. That's what I believe. They they basically, and they also have this uh, this uh, mindset that the client. They say that client is like they give them the highest. You know, uh, like. Uh, they they have tremendous respect for clients, whereas uh, sometimes my, some of the people th that I have worked with uh, in uh, during my during freelancing is that they kind of like uh, don't respect the client enough. They they basically treat the client as a as a person as just a transaction. They don't really care about whether the the solution is good or not. They try to take shortcuts, and whereas Indians they they give they give like massive respect to their clients, and they uh, I've not used that word, but they actually call their clients something. I'm not going to use that over here. But, okay. But they give a very high like uh, uh, like uh, a very high pedestal to their clients. Yeah, but uh, we were uh, here. We were discussing more about communication only. So yeah. For for communication, yeah, so they the do medium, whatever. Yeah. So whatever the, they do, they'll the, do everything that 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 will. 
uh, that will basically give the client a good experience. That is also communication is also part of that. So the medium is language. English, if yeah. we have to, if we have to go with the world. We do not, we better do not talk, uh, if, tell me if I'm wrong, we better do not talk about uh, regressive things, about uh, traditions, about uh, conventions, things like that. I saw language, we should be proud. No, we should, We like you said, that the world, we have to go with the world. world will not go with us. Yeah. Is that's it okay? Yeah, that's true. Thank you, Altamesh, for a very uh, interesting presentation. We learned so much new things about how to uh, start freelancing and what are the issues we need to handle as a, uh, to become a successful freelancer. Uh, I would talk about uh, the general attitude or perception or societal approach towards uh, the freelancing. You know, uh, the question, in, if you talk about our society, the major question is not about those who have actually already started freelancing and how they are progressing. Definitely, uh, they need our support and uh, the guidelines from all those uh, people like you who have succeeded in the field. If you talk about the general uh, attitude, uh, many of us, uh, there are, uh, everybody has a friends. I do have very, uh, some friends who always talk about starting freelancing. They would be talking about, let's start freelancing. We have skills, we are accountants, we can do this thing, that thing. We should start freelancing instead of uh, having a nine to five job, uh, even late, late sitting. So something do something for ourselves. But if you met, me, um, meet them five months later, they again say the same thing. We should start uh, freelancing, do th these things, those things. But uh, they do not start. So the first thing is, we was was the issue. What uh, you would say? What would be your advice? Why we think about all the innovations are uh, the change which come which coming which is coming in the world, but we do not start uh, freelancing. I don't know what's the, it may be the behavioral issue or what we, we uh, there may be the issue that we think that we can't do these things. If you meet 100 people, they think about starting freelancing. Out of 100, 30 to 35 actually start freelancing. And uh, as a, this is also, I think, our behavioral issue, whenever we start anything, we think that we should, from the next day we should earn, we should have a, a client, a project. And out of 30 to 35 people, just 5 to 10 succeed and rest don't. As you said, it requires around 5 to 6 months even for people like you to make initial $100. So how, what would be your advice for those who think, think to start freelancing but they don't? And for those who have started, uh, have to uh, go in, to follow which way, at least uh, with the patience, they will be, uh, should continue and progress in their field. Uh, I'm actually, I believe the question is that uh, what should drive them to, uh, to like, uh, that's what the question is that if somebody wants to start freelancing, yeah. I'll ask them why do you want to start freelancing. Based on their answer, I'll be able to basically... Uh, tell them whether they should or what they should do. But generally speaking, I have uh, spoken about what you need to do before freelancing, uh, before thinking about freelancing. And uh, your question seems to be about your friends that I do not know about. So I can't really tell what is stopping them from starting. But what I can assume is, is that they have nobody to guide them. That's what I can assume, or nobody who can tell them that, okay, however, it's a process. You're not going to start earning immediately. Uh, this is the process. Let's work on this first. Let's work on, let's work on the things. Uh, let's work on uh, what, service, uh, uh, what services are in demand. And after that, let's take a look. Probably freelancing is not for us. We should go with an open mind. We take a look at things. We figure out that this is not for us. We should stick to our jobs. Uh, you have to take a look at these things first, because even though I am a freelancer, it I'll be honest, it hasn't stopped me from from the idea of probably working for a company at some time. It's not that I'm like I'm a freelancer right now, but I still, when if, if I see a job opportunity, I do apply just because I keep an open mind. So if you want to start freelancing, there is a chance that you find out that freelancing is not for you. You, you will have to continue doing, uh, doing your work that you're doing right now. Since I do not know your friends, I cannot sp like be very specific.
my sir sir please mic basically i was asking uh, telling about the general perception of our society if right. you would ask uh, anybody in this room all everyone would have a same kind of story all everyone has friends they think to uh, go for freelancing but they don't okay so how many of you would like to be freelancers if i tell you that uh, sometimes you have to work more than 9 to 5 sometimes you have to work maybe 16 17 hours a day develop extremely bad health problems and give up your social life immediately for the next three years yeah so uh, the, the see two people already said no so that's the thing that that that, that is that is how i can yeah no but uh, you see uh, when i started freelancing now i'm not i i didn't look I, i for six months i didn't take a look at the sun for six months at one time because i used to work during us timings i didn't go out in the sun for six months that's true that's a sacrifice you have to make i don't recommend starting freelancing unless you're very hungry you want to be a millionaire billionaire you just love love earning and providing solutions first you love providing solutions to a number of different people like you don't want to work for one person you want to work for many many people and provide good solutions and enjoy the feeling of your bank account numbers rolling when the money comes in that 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 is what you should enjoy assalamu uh, alaikum sir one thing sir you mentioned that uh, first of all i want to ask that why do you want to start means freelancing so most of the people uh, the answer is that they want to do it like as a profession for their earning all right so in this context then what are your views sir profession for earning yes means uh, you mean uh, like being self employed yes sir uh, no the, like uh, if if your sole reason is to be self employed then you also have to be ready to well you have to first of all ask yourself if you want to be self employed why do you like you can employ yourself but will you be providing the solution that people actually need so if you are a, for example a content writer you have to ask yourself whether people actually need the content that you can provide so you uh, what i would say is that you you should think about starting your own business which is basically free of when you're a freelancer you are a business owner essentially um you have to ask yourself if you do, do you want to become a freelancer just because you want to be self employed if that is that is that is independent yes yeah, if that is that's that is the answer that you give to yourself then i don't suggest you start freelancing that is not a good enough reason the best reason is that people want the solution that you provide and you can get a significant amount of money for that that is that should be the main reason not just self employed you can be self employed i don't, I don't know selling burgers that's self employed <laughs> if you share sir if you don't mind if you share your current earnings so that may 3000 uh, on a bad yeah. bad month uh, 10000 on uh, on a good month thanks thank you sir for uh, the lecture uh, i just wanted to ask wouldn't it be better uh, that the money just remains in the payoneer account so yeah. that so that it it remains in dollars and Does you remember get... the wire wire card issue that happened on Pioneer where every every money the money froze no have I have money in multiple accounts that's my advice when the wi- wire card when a, a wire card the fraud the 2 billion dollar fraud that happened in wire card Pioneer was uh linked to wire, wire card people had their money frozen for about a week and mine was included in that so just have your money in various accounts not just one when they go insolvent or things like that happen Uh, it can be a problem your money can basically freeze and it can take months for you to get it back just uh, know how money works and how the world works how banks work your banks can go bankrupt keep that in mind listen it's a it will be a huge advantage if you ask questions because uh, this is like ask as many questions as you can because we can also role play like a role play with him sir i have one more question uh, sir can you tell more more uh, about the model that we will present the first time to take a project from a client yeah, you should have a video that describes your process you don't need to ex- explain it each, uh, every time like uh have a video step 1 we do this step 2 we do this step 3 we do this step 4 you get the result then we repeat from step 1 until the project is complete thank you 
Hello, sir. Uh, thank you for the session. Uh, I would like to ask that uh, what are the chances of being getting scammed or uh, any fraudulent uh, freelancers or clients? So is there any chances in these websites or would you like to suggest us some safe websites? Fiverr is safe, Upwork is safe. There are scams in every website. There are scams even on Facebook right now. There are scams on every website. You just have to uh, like... Scammers, what they do is, like Indian scammers, and there are many Indian scammers, uh, Indians, what they do is they say that pay us first, then we will work. That is, uh, like, most, um, most of the time they're scammers. I've seen many accounts get banned when I, uh, when I was a client. Uh, I needed to get some work done because I couldn't handle all the projects that were coming. So I, so I hired people, and some of them were asking for, like, $2,000 up front. That is a scammer. His account got banned uh, like uh, one week after that. So how do we know that uh, this person is like not uh, uh, not a scammer and not fraudulent? So based on his profile, or uh, what do we what do we want to see? Uh, like he's uh, a legit person and he can help us. Okay. So I uh, had a project which was supposed to be created in something called Phaser, which is a is a framework. So a Nigerian, um, Nigerian freelancer contacted me and said he can do this. So I said, how will you do this? What is the process? He said, just trust me, sir. What do you think? You, was, was he a scammer or not? That seems like a scammer. He got his account banned. Okay. Yeah. He, 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 wouldn't, he wouldn't have uh, completed the task. He just said, trust me. So if they're not describing the process, if they're not explaining to you how they will do things, they're most likely a scammer. If they ask for money up front, unless they are telling you why they will use it and for what purpose, then uh, it's, it, it, it is a scam. Like, for example, I sometimes ask for cl uh, clients for money up front because I have to buy stuff. So what I do is I ask the client that I need this money so I can buy this stuff. I'm going to give it to him as soon as I buy it. So when they give me the money, I give it to them. So that uh, I have to explain why I'm asking for money up front. Yes, sir. So, so let me get this straight. Like uh, if we want to know that this is a legit person, so we can know from his communication and the details he provides. So yeah. that is based on the communication between the client and the free freelancer. Yes, yes, yes. That exactly. is the point. Uh, another thing is that um, uh, I hired an Indian once for a picture. Now, I don't remember what that picture was. But uh, I asked him, I asked the client for an update. I asked the freelancer for an update. And they, they did give an update, but they gave a file which didn't work. So uh, that guy was a scammer because he was giving a file which did not work. It was just an empty file. It was, it was very strange. It was, a, it was a JPEG, but there was nothing in that JPEG. So I canceled the project with him. And I do not know whether his account is still uh, like uh, uh, like on Fiverr or not. I know other scammers as well. What like a Pakistani once? What he did is he basically inside of his code gave code like the code that uh, like uh, C sharp script, which is a programming thing. He wrote his number inside the code and he gave it to me. So it, if a person is trying to get you off the platform, that is also a sign of a scam. So it should be the communication should be kept on the platform, even on Upwork. Upwork has this policy too, because if there's a dispute, they can come in as an as a third party and say what you're doing is wrong. So if they're trying to take you off the platform, there are scammers, and try to try to have a third party involved all the time. And uh, you have no idea how many times Fiverr has saved me from bad clients and from people that are. Fiverr is the good website. No, Fiverr is. It depends on what suits you. I'll never say that one thing is uh, well, one platform is good because for some people, Upwork has helped them buy Mercedes and you know uh, get, get, earn a very decent living. I mean, uh, the it's not it's it, I cannot say that one platform is good. Okay. It it depends on your personality type and uh, what type suits you. Of work. Yeah. yeah. Right. Thank you. Sir. Please ask questions, role play, very important. Probably more important than the presentation. So we have 
Uh, so we have uh, a few questions from our online user named Stalwart Neophyte. Okay. Uh, first comment from him and then questions. He, uh, he says, he remarks, our Urdu is not good either. Actually, we are pretty bad at learning anything thoroughly. We, al we always look for shortcuts, like with freelancing, people consider it uh, people consider it is a free money, free money without realizing that first they have to train themselves and put their heart and soul to uh, to make themselves a brand and earn money. And I think you already highlighted that point very well. Now he asks, some people are not good at using English, so they lack in communication. How to overcome that deficiency? For me, what worked was that I, I had friends who were good at English, and I asked them, caring friends, and asked, asked them to talk to me in English, and at least I, I became fluent. So that's what worked for me. I can only share what worked for me. Other methods I don't know. I don't think Udemy courses or any kind of course can help you. Uh, if you're not good at something, do more of it, practice it, and you'll be, you'll be good at it. Like uh, my wrestling coach says, if you're not good at wrestling, wrestle, wrestle more. You'll be fine. You'll, you'll get better. And, and b better write in English rather than in Roman yeah. while chatting or texting. Yes. Uh, second question from him. Udemy charges for the courses. Uh, are those self-paced and available offline or they have some expiry? No, there are, uh, most of them have lifetime access. But you will not be able to download those uh, videos. Uh, when, my course, which is, going to be, uh, which, is, which is going to be released hopefully within the next two months, it's, uh, it, it, I will make sure that all the videos can be downloaded because I'm a, I'm a guy who likes to, the users to be free so they can do whatever they want with the videos. Next question. People use the term hook regarding job proposals. Can you shed some light on what kind of hooks can be used or uh, say some example of hooks, for example, about your gaming gig? My, uh, how I write proposals is that I don't use hooks in, in my proposals. I, uh, my proposals are just one line. No, literally they are one line. When, when, when uh, in, in job detail, when I read the job details, I ask a question. I don't even write a proposal. I don't think proposals work. I'm, I, I believe in statements of work, and my proposals on Upwork are, are just one or two lines, and it's remarkable how many people respond to those. Just questions. So I, I don't use hooks. My hook is basically I keep the client engaged by talking about the problems and all the recommending solutions and, and uh, trying to figure out what, the, what solution the client values the most. Uh, the last question from uh, Mr. Stalbert Newfight. What's your opinion about digital marketing? Will you categorize it in freelancing? And is it more about, or it is more about communication and selling? So again, learn communication and sales become more important. Your comments. Digital marketing, can, uh, freelancers can be digital marketers, uh, I mean, we can offer digital marketing as a freelancer. Uh, but as far as I can tell, digital marketing, you are more of a contract-based employee if you're a digital-based marketer, as far as I can tell, because you will be working for a very long time for one particular, uh, one, one, one organization for a very long time. Like in digital marketing, you cannot jump from one client to another because it's a long process, as far as I can tell. I'm not, I don't know much about digital marketing, but I do know uh, is that uh, digital marketers usually have two or three clients that they work with again and again. So it's, it's uh, like, you're basically at that, at, at that point, you're uh, kind of like a contract-based employee instead of a full-time one. There's one notification, but let me refresh the page. Okay, he says thank you for forwarding my questions. Okay, you're welcome. That concludes the online questions. Any final remark? Good luck. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>